The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Father Andrew Kinstetter. Hi, Father Andrew. Hello, Dom. And Pat Scott. Hi, Pat. Hello, all. So uh, we are once again gathered together here in this Advent season, uh, but talking about technology. And uh, as we've been doing in our recent weeks, we, we're going to talk about so our Christmas gift ideas for the techie gadget person in your life. Uh, these are just some things that, we're, that we think might be worth consideration um, if, you're, if you're trying to figure out what to get somebody or to put on your own Christmas list, perhaps. And, uh, and, and these might be some, some fun things to think about. Uh, so, Pat, I'm going to let you go first. Uh, what, is, what do you have to, to offer on some uh, Christmas gift ideas? Well, everybody in my family, when they walk in the door, wants to find a place to charge their device. So I have become very enamored of Anchor's products, and they have ones that have four or six or whatever little charging stations. All you do is just plug in the right one, and uh, and they're all right together. It doesn't take up a lot of space, and it sure saves the devices going choking while people are talking or whatever. And so I've given a link, or there will be a link, to both the, the USB chargers that are, are great for uh, this, this family type of setup, as well as the portable charging banks. I've got several of those, one that looks like an oversized lipstick that fits in my purse really well, and others are a little bit larger that I slip down in my iPad case, but to be able to charge up while I'm on the go. And uh, so that's that's my first pick of the week or the first Christmas pick. Pardon me. So, uh, yeah, those are great ideas. Um, I, I, the, uh, what I love about the anchor ones is that they come in various form factors. So some are round, some are thin, some are uh, chunkier. Uh, and it, so it's just for different uses, like one I keep in a it's it's, it's, a semi, it's slim. I keep in my pocket uh, it's sort of like, you know, like a, next to my wallet. Uh, which is great, and it it's not very large, so it does it won't do a long charge, but it's usually got just enough uh, to to get me there. And then you can get ones that are gigantic that you have to carry around a suitcase that'll power everything for a week. You know, I mean, it's that's uh, it's got the range, so that's a great idea. I like the portable power bank ones, and and that's also the the kind that you plug into the wall. Um, if if you're like the average family, I think I read today, the average family has eleven devices in their home. So right. a, a couple of these six-port <laughs> charging devices might be useful to, to, for, for some people. And I've really had very good success with the quality of the Anchor products. So I just almost don't buy anybody else's charging or power blocks. Yes. Uh, if it's got the Anchor brand name, I'm like, mm, that's that's for me. That's good. All right. Excellent. Uh, Father Andrew, what do you have for a uh, your first Christmas gift idea? Uh, so my first Christmas gift idea, uh, there's... Uh, tiny little backstory to it. Um, I was in Denver in November and came across an Amazon brick and mortar store. And mm -hmm. out of sheer curiosity, went to check it out with my brother. And in there, there was this cool little Bluetooth enabled Star Wars device that you put your hand over the top of it and it senses your hand and it controls what's happening on the app uh, for iOS or Android. And so what it is, is it's a, it's a device by, by Kano, and it's, it's basically, it's called a Star Wars The Force Coding Kit. So it's, a, it's an actual little Bluetooth motion-sensitive little device that you build yourself. There's instructions in this, in this package. You build the little motion-sensitive device. You can make it the Empire or the Rebellion, and you can make it light up red or light up blue. But then there's a companion app to it that works. Um, I think it works for for iOS, Android, but I think it also works on a on a computer as well, as long as it can connect to this this device. But the whole idea is that you are actually 
building the code, so a computer code that would operate how this device works and what happens when you put your your hand over the top of this device, how it responds within the app. So it's a it's an awesome visual way and a fun way to teach young people how to code without giving them a book on C++ and, <laughs> you know, just telling right. them to, to learn. Um, so, and, and I, that was my only experience of it. So it's, it's, uh, it's meant for, for young kids to, to, um, the elderly. So it's not a age specific sort of thing. And, um, I had to throw out a star Wars gift, uh, for Christmas this year, regardless. So of course, uh, mom, if you're listening, this, <laughs> this might be something that I would like to. <laughs> I know I'm looking at you. I was thinking it had to be a star Wars, uh, gift. So that's of course, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, that's really cool. I know, uh, I know some children who would like something like that. So <laughs> I'll have to, uh, keep that in mind. It's kind of like Swift playgrounds that Apple has the app that on the, on the iPad, uh, but Star Wars, which makes it like 10 yeah. times cooler. So that's, oh, total. <laughs> that's awesome. a lot of force behind it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I like that. So my uh, first Christmas gift idea here is something uh, somewhat practical, I think. Um, and it is, and I got the wrong link to it, but uh, it's a travel electronics bag. And what that, what I mean by that is uh, it's a bag for organizing all of the cords and cables and uh you know the all the gadgets that you like if you go on a trip or even if you're taking a laptop back and forth to work instead of having all that stuff just loose in the bottom of your bag it organizes it for you it has a slot for each one and and you uh you know you it keeps it all together in one place so that you know when you when you need the cable it's there and you can just pull it out and and you have it available to you. So uh, it's there's a couple different kinds. There's I I like one that's just a mesh bag. So it's a it's sort of a it's a, I think sometimes they they or they advertise them as like uh, makeup bags. But it's just a it's a see, sort of see through mesh bag. And I I check my stuff in there. There are other ones that are a bit more organized where you're um you, they have slots that you put the cables in. So there's a couple different kinds. I'll put a couple different links in the show notes. So you can you can check them out, but it's a it's a nice pr practical gift, and they're really inexpensive. So you could probably get a couple for somebody, or you know, for stocking stuffers for a bunch of people. Uh, they're really useful. So, uh, travel electronics cable organizing bags. All right, so that's our first set of Christmas gift ideas. Pat, what's your second uh, Christmas gift idea? Well, when I got the iPhone uh, 10, I realized it has a capability of charging wirelessly, which I had never been interested in. But uh, my brother had a little uh, charging station for one of his phones that was uh, kind of a slanted thing that you could just sit on your desk and just slap it in there. And I thought, that sounds kind of cool. So I went and Anchor had one. And it has been really nice. It sits right on my, my uh, computer desk, and I just slap the phone in there, or just lay it in there, and it charges while I'm working, and yet I can still see it and, and use it as opposed to being across the room in my charging station. So I found that uh, to be very helpful, and guess what? It's by Anchor again. <laughs> so uh, at any rate, that's, uh, the, that's what I would suggest. Excellent. Yeah, uh, I have the same model uh, sitting on my bedside, uh, right next to my bed. It's really nice. Um, the nice thing about there's the it, the fact that it stands up is that when it lights up with a an alert, you know, uh, or a notification, I mean, uh, you can see it as opposed to having to like bend over or, or have to pick it up off the charger. So right. yeah, that's a that's a good one. Father Andrew, uh, what's what's your next uh, Christmas gift idea? So my next one, I'm going to keep kind of going with the the fun gaming kind of theme here. Uh, I really enjoy little tiny puzzles. So if you were to walk into my office right now, and I was going to grab it, but it's on the other side of the office. But I have a <laughs> I have a Rubik's Cube in my office. Mm -hmm. But I also have some of those other little puzzles that you have to like take the metal pieces apart and put it back together. And so I find that they're just really fun things to have in the office as you're just kind of hanging out or if someone's coming to visit or you've got, you know, kids in the office and they want something to play with. So I just I love puzzles like that. And so my Christmas idea for the techie is what's called the Go Cube. 
Um, have not actually played with this, but was watching YouTube videos on it, and it looks really fun. It's basically a smart Rubik's Cube. Ooh. So it's it's a Rubik's Cube, and it connects to an app on Android or iOS. And on the, the app, you have a live uh, 3D animation of the Rubik's Cube. So as you turn the cube, it's going to show on the screen what it looks like. And the idea is that you can actually it will it will teach you how to solve the Rubik's cube. Ooh, I need that. So you can you can <laughs> learn how to do it, but there's also ways to set it up so that you and someone else can can basically battle each other for for how quickly you can solve it. There's other puzzles built into the app that you have to use the Rubik's cube for, and it's just a, a really fun way that you can add some tech to to the puzzle that is the rubik's cube because if you just have the rubik's cube and you're not super familiar with it you might just try to you know try it for a little bit and then give up and not not go back to it so very cool that is my second pick for christmas that is cool i mean i'm i'm old enough where the rubik's cube was just like if you wanted to solve it you just broke it apart and put it back together again the right way <laughs> rip off the stickers <laughs> or, or oh my brother did that once ruined my rubik's cube <laughs> oh <laughs> But uh, this is really cool, and like uh, there looks like there are games that go with it too. Like you can, yep, uh, games that for, on the on the phone or the tablet. That's really neat. Wow, what are they? Yeah, I I know who that'll go to. I've got a, somebody in mind already, <laughs> and it's not you, Dom. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, th that means uh, I get the last pick here, and mine is a, a bit of a, a another uh, somewhat practical uh, device for kids. Uh, they are. Puro Sound Labs Volume Limited Kids Bluetooth Headphones. Uh, now, the the two two aspects of this make it really attractive to me. One is they're Bluetooth, means they're wireless. Uh, my kids have headphones with wires that they plug into iPads or iPhones, and they're constantly like I used to before I did went Bluetooth, constantly catching the cord on stuff and knocking the phone to the ground and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so uh, this is a, uh, a, a they're, they're Bluetooth, so that eliminates the cord. But the other thing that's really nice about them, which is even better, is that they're volume limited. They, they, they are prevented from getting above uh, the World Health Organization's recommended level of 85 decibels. Uh, because they, their recommendation is basically to protect young listeners' eardrums from early hearing damage uh, by, by limiting the total of volume possible. Which is, I think, is really great. I think that's a a, a nice idea. Um, uh, and they they come in a variety of colors, and they're not too expensive. Uh, they're they're, you know, for for Bluetooth headphones, uh, of somewhat pretty good quality. They're they're uh, what is it like sixty bucks right now on Amazon? So not not too expensive. So that's a pretty good price. So uh, yeah, th those are my pick: the uh, volume limited Bluetooth headphones from Puro Labs. Cool. All right. Excellent. So that's a good set. So, folks, we've had a whole bunch of Christmas gift ideas for you over the last few weeks. And uh, if you want to check them out, you can go to our uh, website, sqpn.com slash technology, and look at the uh, last several episodes, the show notes from the, from our last several episodes to see the, the all the different gift ideas that we've had. And uh, if, you're, if you're hurting for a gift idea for a techie friend or a gadget hound, uh, maybe one of these will work for you. Excellent. This is Dom Bettinelli, CEO of SQPN, with a special message. The StarQuest Network is fulfilling its mission to explore the intersection of faith and pop culture, and in the past year we've reached stunning new heights. Our programs are reaching broad new audiences with a message that helps us discern good entertainment, make sense of the world, and share the gospel with others. We continue to launch new shows and bring back great shows. We just relaunched Secrets of Star Wars, which comes at the perfect moment to capture the excitement over the new show, The Mandalorian, and the climax of the new Star Wars movies. The support of our audience is vital to this work and has helped us grow closer to meeting our financial obligations. For that, we are very grateful. But we still need to close the gap. Every new gift extends our deadline. But until we eliminate our deficits, the future of StarQuest and your favorite shows remain in question. This is why it's crucial we hear from you this Advent and Christmas, the time when nonprofits receive most of their support for the year. If you're already a supporter of StarQuest, we are very grateful and we ask you to prayerfully consider increasing increasing your support at this time. If you are not yet a supporter, please become one now. We urgently need your help in every gift counts. 
Could you give $15 or even just $10 per month? That lets us provide more than 40 hours of professionally produced shows with compelling content. We have special thank you gifts for donors at several giving levels. If you are a business owner or just want to provide a leadership level of support, we now have a special giving level for sponsors, like in public broadcasting. For $500 per month, you or your business can sponsor one of the shows on our network. Listeners will hear a message in every episode thanking you for your sponsorship and giving your website. We'll also have your name and link on the SQPN webpage and in the show notes of every episode during your sponsorship. Whatever level of support you can offer, whether large or small, please show your support for SQPN this Christmas, and remember that your gifts are tax-deductible. Just go to sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. And may God bless you and yours as we approach the celebration of our Lord's birth. All right, so uh, let's move on to our uh, next topic this week. We wanted to talk about uh, the important topic of two-factor authentication. Now, two-factor authentication, sometimes called multi-factor authentication, is a method of making making, uh, computer devices more secure than just through a password. A password is 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 an okay password. security in in fact in that it's better than no no security at all no password at all uh but a two factor authentication requires you to have uh, two out of three different factors or pieces of information in order to unlock something that's secure with two factor authentication so uh the, those two the three different possibilities are usually something you know something you have and something you are so, for example, something you know is usually a password of some sort. Something you have is usually either like a uh, a, a key, like a key fob, like a like a like a radio transmitting uh, USB key, or something along those lines, or a second co- two factor code. And we'll get into how, where that comes from, why that's different from a password. And then something that that you are is like biometrics, a fingerprint, a face ID, those sorts of things. So, for example, if if you were to unlock your phone and it required both your face ID and a thumbprint and a password to unlock it, that would be two-factor authentication. All right. So, so usually two-factor authentication means, uh, we, for for our purposes, is a password and a code that is being constantly generated. It's constantly new that uh, you have to uh, enter into uh, a system. Uh, so the the most common kind is is this kind is generated by uh, Google, uh, they they offer this service, and you, it's it's time based, so that what happens is is when you're setting, and we'll talk, we'll get into a little bit about how to set it up, but when you're setting up your second factor of authentication, you usually have a QR code on the screen, and you use either the Google Authenticator app, and we'll have links to it in the show notes, or another app that generates the two factor codes, uh, that you you hold up your phone to it. It, and take a picture of it, and it reads that special, uh, unique QR code, gets a special, unique number, and generates uh, a a matching code that's on the Google server and on yours. And then it combines that with the time and date, and then generates a unique six-digit number. And that six-digit number changes every thirty seconds. And as long as you have that app on your phone and you have that code still set up correctly on your phone. You're, you will be in sync with the Google servers every 30 seconds. Am I on target there, uh, Pat and Andrea? Does that sound about right? That sounds pretty good. Okay. Yeah. The only thing that I would throw in there is is um, perhaps some way that people might already be familiar with it is often if you're uh, logging into a website, sometimes they will text message you a, a code. Right. Um, and that's also a form of two-factor authentication. But it's inherently less secure right. because if someone were to steal your SIM card or simulate your your phone number, they could potentially uh, receive that text message with that number and then use that to log into your device, which is why the Google Authenticator app is not linked to your SIM card or your phone number. So it's more secure right? and is definitely the way that, that I go. And then the other method that Google also uses is, and Apple, 
that if you have your phone with you and you are trying to log into something else, it will use one of their own apps to pop up a notification, which gets around the text uh, issue of, of security. Right. And the app then says, are you trying to sign in? Here's the code you type in. And so that's a little easier for most people to understand. Uh, but the, the Google Authenticator is is a very strong method and, right. and the other Authenticator programs. Yeah, the Google app method works because you are presumably already logged in on that app. You've already correct. signed you in already on that app. You've already verified who you were and everything. That's right. correct. Exactly. Yeah, like one way to think about like two-factor authentication is like when you go to an ATM to get money out, you have something you know, which is your PIN. And something you have, which is your, in this case, your debit card. And that's two things. So, so that's a, that's two factors. All right. So, you know, one of the, and it actually, Father, you made a good point about the text messaging. A lot of, a lot of uh, websites and services, they try to do this with text messaging and text messaging is inherently insecure. It's not a secure method of communication. It can be intercepted. It can be your, like you said, your, Phone number can be spoofed. We've seen lots of TV shows and movies that show the bad guys spoofing, cloning people's phones and able to uh, to receive their phone calls and messages and stuff. So that's not a, a, an inherently secure way. It's okay, especially if you're using a service that's not really all that important, you know, as important that you, like it's not your bank or something like that. Uh, so uh, there are there are several different good apps that you can use with uh, to to generate these codes. One of them, like I mentioned, is a Google Authenticator app, which you can download for iOS and Android and, and, and pretty much all the uh, all the various uh, ser- uh, operating systems out there. Um, there's a there's a third party app also called called Authy A U T H Y, which also generates the Google Authenticator c- uh, codes. What makes it a little different and in my mind a little better is it offers a few extra features like the ability to back up your codes so that you know for instance if if something were to happen to your phone with your google authenticator app on it and you could not you'd have to reset up all of your uh, two-factor authentications from scratch you'd have to go, you know go back in and say i lost my password let's start from scratch that's a real pain in the neck authy uh lets you back back it up to a file that you can then save offline not in the cloud you have to save it somewhere safe and secure in your home, for example, um, and it also it, it does also le- allow you to sync it to the cloud in a secure ha- uh, form, uh, which is maybe not like it's not Department of Defense secure, but it's pretty secure as long as you use a pretty good backup password on it. Um, but that also helps you in case again, if you lose your phone or you get a new phone and you just want you want to resync your phone to the to the code. So. The Authy is a pretty good app. And the, the other thing it really it has that I really like is that it has an Apple Watch uh, app on it so that I can, once I'm logged in on my watch, uh, and as long as the watch is, you know, on my wrist, it, it's it's logged in, then I can um, get the codes on my watch without having to pull out my phone. So that's a good thing. Um, another Another service or another app that's out there is Microsoft has their own authentication system, the Microsoft Authenticator app that uh, they use with their various services. So Microsoft Office, OneDrive, uh, uh, you know, the, all of the different Microsoft services that are out there. I think Skype now actually just started offering Microsoft Authenticator um, uh, authentication, two-factor authentication. So do you guys know of any other systems that are out there? LastPass that? has one also. And each of these, uh, like the Microsoft one, for instance, isn't just uh, for Microsoft products. You can use it as an authenticator for other things as well. Right. LastPass, as I say, has one out there. Other than that, I am not familiar with any others. Did you mention 1Password? Well, 1Password uses the Google uh, okay. Authenticator system, uh, but that's what that's another one. Yes, uh, the, you can you can set up Google uh, set two factor codes in uh, inside of 1Password. Um, Oh, you know another one that uses it is Steam. The gaming uh, platform also has a has their own Steam app that you can put on your phone. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had yeah. to use that a few times. Like when you lo- when I'm logging in, like on the on my desktop, it wants the code from my phone. Um, that sort of thing. That's a big deal because a lot of times when you these games are expensive, and sometimes you get um, 
loot and various things that you buy, like the uh, in-app purchasing. And so a lot, they could have lots of money tied up in these games, uh, you know, that, that especially, uh, I mean, some of these games you can, you can buy extras for hundreds and hundreds of dollars and people could steal it from you if they were able to log into your account. So it's important to keep, um, uh, keep that secure. And that's why they offer that. That and Facebook also does that too. Yeah. Do they have a, they have a separate authenticator? Well, they have, if you've got their app, then you go to mm-hmm. the app and get the code from there. It's oh, built into the yeah. Facebook app. Okay. Okay. That's right. That's right. Now that you mention it. So let's talk about like how you, how you set it up. I don't want to get in too much into the details because the, each one varies a little bit, but sort of the, 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 the broad strokes of it is when you're going to a website, you're, either you're setting up an account for the first time, or you've already got an account and you want to set up the, the, uh, the two factor authentication. What happens, as I mentioned this before, is usually what happens is something along the lines of it'll put a QR code up on your screen. And you, you, it's that little square that's got all the, the blocks on it in a random pattern. Uh, and what you'll do is you'll open up your Authenticator app on your phone, let's say, and you'll say, I'm adding a new two-factor. And then you'll hold your phone up. It'll ask to use the camera if it's the first time. You'll hold your phone up and you'll just hold it up in front of the code. And it's usually really quick. You don't have to say, take a picture. It just sees it and, and connects. And then it will set it up. It, it it does all the work itself, and then it will generate a code for the first time. And then on screen, the 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 on your on your computer, say it will also generate a code in the website or service that you're setting up the two factor for. And what what it wants is you to enter in the code from that you just generated on your phone, so that it makes sure that okay we're properly matched up, right? We're we're all set and. The, couple things it does is a lot of times they'll either say okay now you print out this form or this code or save this code somewhere this is your this is your backup this is your only way in in case if you if you lose this um sometimes they'll say here are 10 uh one-time codes that will always work you can print this out or save this somewhere uh something like that and Please, please do that. <laughs> print it out, save it, put it in a lockbox, uh, put it somewhere safe. Because a lot of times, if you don't do that, you're gonna you, you you'll just lose access to that account if you lose your two fa- your second factor. It's it's that secure. It's a good thing. It's a it's a good thing that it's secure. Um, and that's pretty much it. And then just uh, whenever you need to generate a code, you'll open the app. You'll go to the particular entry for that website, and uh, the 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 say Google will ask for your code and you'll look it up on your phone and you'll see the, the numbers there and you'll just type them in right that like that and hit enter. And as long as you haven't expired the 30 seconds, it's usually giving you a, a clock of uh, the time that's going to expire before you ha- it generates a new code. As long as you get that in any time, you're all set. So it's pretty convenient. Uh, so uh, what, uh, what do you guys use for your authentication in general? I mean, I know there's several different kinds of there I use, but what what do you do in general for your authentication, Pat? Uh, I typically use the uh, Microsoft one, and I've got most of my accounts set up in there. Uh, as I say, I also have the you know the Google two factor that just pops up in the apps, and so I can either pick up my Android phone or I can pick up my iPhone, and it pops up within the app. Okay, you know here here you go. Or are you you really trying to sign in? I have used uh, the Google one. I just find the Microsoft a little easier to set up for some reason. I don't mm-hmm. know why, uh, but it it seemed to work faster for me. And okay. the main thing is is to remember that that when you are logging into these important accounts that you need to factor on, keep your phone handy because right. you know if it's not there, that's a very very frustrating issue. Right. Right. Uh, Father Andrew, what do you do for your uh, authentication? I have used the Google Authenticator app for years and years and years. Uh, so I use it uh, for pretty much all my main accounts, Google, Dropbox. Uh, I've got Facebook on there. I've got my Microsoft account on there. I've got Twitter on there as well. And I've never had a had a reason to explore any of the others. So I've never actually looked at the Microsoft or Authy or any of those. I uh, have never looked into them. So. The Google Authenticator is simple for me to use, and I think it's pretty just basic and straightforward. I may have tried it early on and ran into some bumps. I need to go back mm-hmm. and play with it some more. Yeah, I, yeah. I use and it's back. Yeah, go ahead. It's it's through Google, so and I trust Google, and they're typically known to be a pretty secure and private 
company uh, compared to some some of the others out there. And so I, yeah, I've always just I'll put my bets on them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I I was a Google Authenticator user early on and switched to Authy. I had a bad experience where I screwed up and deleted the app, the Google Authenticator app off my phone and lost everything and had to start from scratch and oh. it was a real that's why my warning earlier was it was heartfelt uh so uh, that's why I, I ended up switching to authy because i like having the backup and the, that sec- knowledge that it's somewhere i also do something else which is again I, you, you mentioned earlier father Andrew, and we, we briefly touched on it i also put them in one password uh the reason being is my my password to get into one password is very secure i'm very confident that it is safe uh, so, and I like the, uh, the convenience that when I'm logging in on my, on my browser, on my desktop, what, what it does is if I've got two, the second factor in the account on one password, I log, I hit the, 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 uh, shortcut enters in my username and password, and then it puts the one time code into the clipboard buffer so that when that comes up, I can just paste it in. Um, uh, and the nice thing is, is then it reverses that after I've logged in and puts whatever was in the clipboard buffer before back in it so that I, I don't have to lose my, you know, whatever, if I was copying and pasting something somewhere, I don't lose that. So that's, that's really nice. Um, and I, so I, I generally like doing that in, in, so what, what I, the way I do it is, is I set up in both authenticator and one password at the same time so that uh, when the QR code pops up, I do it with my phone and then before I do anything, I also uh, use one password to also record the QR code and set it up in one password at the same time, so that I have it in two places. I I'm not going to get caught again. <laughs> You're losing my codes. That's just that's just me. So uh, I feel I feel fairly confident about that. Now I, that I've said it on a podcast, that something horrible is going to happen. <laughs> but uh, one other. Second factor authenticator that uh, we we didn't mention here, uh, we might have briefly touched on it was is that Apple has their own uh, system, of course, <laughs> and the way that it works is uh, it relies on m- most Apple users having more than one Apple device, and that that's that's the limitation of it. It, it you could you have to have two Apple devices for it to work, uh, two Apple devices on your Apple ID account, and so if you have say a phone and an iPad, you, when you doing certain things that where it requires you to log in and have that second factor, it will pop up something on your screen, a dialog box, and will say, someone's trying to log in your account from, and then it will usually give a location. That location can vary. If it's not your phone, for instance, which has a GPS, say it's your iPad, it's going to try to go based on, its best guess based on maybe the Wi-Fi signals that it sees around, it triangulates them, or sometimes they can try to, Figure, finagle out a location based on the IP address from the uh, internet service provider. For example, whenever I do this, it's, it usually either has me in Framingham, Massachusetts, or Randolph, Massachusetts, two towns that are not the town I live in, <laughs> which are generally far away. But I usually, I'm like, okay, I I know it's always one of those two, so uh, that's fine. And then you, and then it gives you a code, and you just enter it in. So it's a little different, but it's still pretty good, and again, better than nothing. Um, and one of the nice things that, that Apple does is, um, if you do get codes in via iMessage, you know, via text, it will offer to, uh, paste those in on your iPhone or on your, if you're using Safari, for instance, it'll offer to paste them in automatically. Again, the getting the, getting them via text is not recommended, but if that's what they have, that's what they have. I mean, frankly, TurboTax should stop doing it via te- uh, text, for instance. I, I know that they, they Intuit has been doing it that way. It, they're, they're, a lot of these systems need to get better at this. Um, I think Twitter also does it via text. Just a terrible idea. But if you have a choice of having just a password or a, a second authenticator and using text, I would always go for the second authenticator, yes. even if it's text. Because it's... At least better. whenever there's a vulnerability <laughs> in in two factor, even with uh, security experts, they say yes. Even if we found a flaw in the two factor, it's still better than 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 just the password. Always, right. always. That's so. right. That's right. Uh, w- w- one other thing I was going to say was uh, if you if you have say shared accounts, for for instance, uh, a business. You know, you say you have a like a like you have a company or a store or a business. 
with a company Twitter account or face tw- company Facebook uh, business, you know, a business account or something along those lines that you need a two factor on that. Uh, it's hard to share two factor as we've just yeah. mentioned. So that's one another reason why it might be good if you have like a a team or or company one password you can put it in a shared vault with the two factor in there and then people then anyone who has access to that shared vault has access to the the second factor code so uh that's something to consider yeah i had a client that basically they were sharing one dop, dropbox account again across all of their their people and they would all all do that and then when the two factor got turned on then they'd always have to wait for the one person to call in and <laughs> right. i said get the team version you're yeah. going to be so much better off and each person can authenticate their own that way that's right that's right it's much it's much more secure if everybody can have their own and and uh, but like for instance we use hootsuite here at sqpn to to manage our social media and the way there's they do have so, something called single sign on it's it's much heavier duty than we need so what we do is we have a shared one password vault that uh, we put the the one the, the single account in with the two factor authentication in it but yeah with you know something like dropbox it's intended to be used by one person at a time right, so right uh, th- that's that's different yes um any other considerations that you can think of with uh, thinking with two factor authentication anything else we should be talking about well, the one thing I try to tell my clients is that, again, remember whoever is going to be helping you if you're in the hospital. You've got to be able to, like, I usually tell people, wherever your will is, also put your page of your master passwords and what device you use to authenticate with and what password you use to get into that device. Because if if all of a sudden you're gone and somebody can't get into any of your accounts because they don't have your phone the way to get into it, you've got a problem. Right, right. That's a good point. Um, and uh, that's probably a good place to also put your backup codes and all that sort of thing yes. because if something happens to you and your phone at the same right. time, uh, then, you're, then you're in big trouble. You don't want to make life any more difficult for your loved ones uh, at that really difficult time. So good something to consider. All right. Uh, and any other considerations then? Um, I think we've pretty much covered most of it. If if folks, if you have any particular questions, anything that we've mentioned that uh, you want to us to clarify further in a future episode, please feel free to let us know. Uh, send an email to technology at sqpn dot com, and we'll be happy to to try to you know clear it up and get some more information to you. But uh, this is very important, and it's worthwhile uh, trying to figure it out and doing it well. And we'll we'll put some resources in our show notes that link to uh you know, more information about setting up two-factor authentication all right so let's move on uh, to some headlines this week uh speaking of passwords uh google chrome is got a new version out and it's now incorporating uh, a new feature that warns you when your password has been stolen uh now they've there's been services before uh one called pwn to own and i think that's what it's called right Pwn to own and yep. and others like that and and even uh Chrome extensions that you could use that would warn you when you when your passwords have been stolen. Well, this is now incorporated right into uh, Chrome itself, so that when you're at a website and you're going to log in, it will say, "Oh, that's your username. Yeah, your password's been stolen. <laughs> you need to change your password," uh, which is very helpful. Now, h- how do how do it know? Is the uh, the old saying go? How does how does it know that it's that your password's been stolen? Well, one of the things that is, uh, happens is when these passwords are stolen, they're often um, sold on the dark web or posted even just for free in these big databases. And uh, and sometimes not the password itself, but all of the uh, usernames on that website, which is usually your email, uh, will be p- posted sort of as a, hey, the bad guy says, I have all of these accounts. If anybody wants to buy the password for them, you know, come see me. And so folks, security folks who work at Google and other places will go through those, collect those up, and put them into a database so that they can compare them against their own users so that they can warn people. And so that's a, it's a very good service that they do. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's, it's useful. And there's a couple other ways that they, they keep you safe. There's all, they also have uh, better phishing protection um, to keep track of these bad sites that tr- pretend to be other things like they pretend to be PayPal to get you to log in and give you their, your uh, username and password and that sort of stuff. So um, 
Yeah, so that's uh, the newest version of Google Chrome, uh, version 79, I think it is. So if you haven't updated, do so. Chrome is good about updating itself, so it's not a uh, not too much to worry about. So what do you think of the of this new feature? Is it useful, worthwhile, or do you think it's caused confusion? What do you think? One of the first thoughts was is it would be very helpful, and the other second thought was how much much slower is the browser when it's checking this stuff? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Chrome has a has a reputation for being a bit bloated and slow at times. So I wonder if it's if it if the password checkup tool has to pull the database every time you go to a website. Well, and, and the other question is, is it, is it a toggle that's assumed on that you could turn off if you if you feel like you're a person that's that's on top of this stuff? That would it, be a nice option if they would just does, let you do that. Yeah, it does so you can turn it off in the sync settings in Chrome. Okay, good. So that's good. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. I think that there are a number of people out there who you know, create one password for, for every account and then just kind of, you know, right. don't worry about it. Right. So, so this kind of a service from, from Chrome would at least, you know, alert them like, Hey, change your password. And then ideally that would help them to become a little bit more uh, security minded. Right. Yeah. That, that would, that's actually really good. You, the, people sometimes just need that little bit of prompting and a little bit of reminding by the way, you know you're you're, you're kind of hanging out here in the wind. You, you're a little uh, exposed here to to the bad guys. You might want to uh, fix some stuff. And oh, you're right. Yeah, I should probably uh, change that password or update that. So yeah, that's really good. And folks, again, if you don't have a password manager, get one. It's the very first thing, the most important thing you should have for your security online, uh, and and that will help you with that. All right. So our second headline this week is an article about Apple. Uh, well, it's about being a good stewards of the earth. And the fact is, is that it's not really an Apple problem per se. They use the Apple in the headline. It says Apple's activation lock sends iPhones to the scrap heap instead of to refurbishers. And it's not really an Apple problem. This is a, just a general technology problem where one a good thing that we we that Apple implemented and others other manufacturers have is a, a lock on the phone, which makes it less desirable for those who want to steal it. If someone steals your iPhone, you can remotely lock it so that it's useless. It becomes it's as we say uh, colloquially a brick. It's it's a hunk of uh, electronics that can't be reactivated as a phone or be used as an electronic device, uh, and and that's good because it deters thieves. It's it doesn't give them any incentive to steal your phone. However, uh, what this, according to this article and uh, the Wireless Alliance, which is a electronics recycler and refurbisher in Colorado, they said it has the unintended side effect of of um, lot lots of people are forgetting to turn off activation lock when they get rid of their old phones, and that prevents them from being recycled or reused uh, on this on the secondhand market. What do you think? Is this a is this a big problem? Is this um, a recycler who just wants to get a press release out? Um, is this an Apple problem, a consumer problem? What do you think of this? Well, the I have seen issues where because somebody had died or somebody had forgotten because they were in an accident and had a had a concussion, they may not know how to get back into their device, and that device they can't be used again. And I really wish there was a way you could say, well. We'll tell, send this back to Apple. We don't need it back again. Just send it to Apple. Let them unlock it and wipe wipe the data. But yes, I see this as becoming much more of a problem. Somebody steals the phone. They can't use it. It goes in the trash or it can't be reused, can't be recycled. And with Android phones, you, you can wipe them. So it is more of an Apple problem. You can wipe a phone that like, so with an Android phone, it can be wiped there is right. no activation lock. That's, so there's no activation lock. And by the way, it's also come up on Apple Watches that somebody might have sold an Apple Watch to somebody else, forgot to remove the activation lock. They can't get a hold of the person they bought it from anymore. They threw the information away. This was an actual case. They've got a, a watch they paid for that they can't use. So one of the things I think I was thinking of, I was going to say, was uh, with an Android phone, though, the uh, the flip side is is if you can erase it and it can, and it doesn't have an activation lock, that means that if someone can steal a phone and you have no recourse, they they've got it. That's and, true. And they can, they, they, so they have more incentive 
for stealing it. But I, I mean, I see it's it's sort of a you're kind of weighing these two these two goods here the the good of the activation lock and the good of being able to wipe and recycle. I I think the activation lock is sort of separate from the someone dies and you don't have their password. That's not really the activation lock, is it? I mean, that's really just the password. Well, no, it's an activation lock because if you don't have the password, you can't get back into the phone. You can't reuse it. You can't reset it. Right. But that's not a that's not about activation lock. That's just password, right? No, I'm talking about activation lock. Oh, I see what you're saying. So even if I don't have the password, if I just want to wipe the phone. To give it to a family member, you can't. Right. Okay. I see what you're saying. Right. Yeah. There's now, that. it would be nice if Apple had, I won't say a back door, but some way that they could say, we can take these phones and recycle them responsibly, refurbish them, or it well, could be one one thing to say they can unlock it, but nobody else can. So one thing that Apple, like, so I think there's two things that they're going on. There's refurbishing and there's recycling. So Apple does take old phones and dismantles them, and they saves, dismantle them, but they can't be reused. But they can't they can't be reused as phones. They take the parts right. and they recycle them. They melt them down, that sort of thing. But to be reused as phones, they can't do that unless unless they are uh, unlocked. That's true. And uh, like if if you have, have upgraded a phone in any t- any iPhone any time recently, you you get instructions from you know, you know if you've upgraded and traded in a phone, you usually get instructions about how to unlock it. You have to sign out of iCloud, and then you can reset, uh, erase all content and settings from the phone, and that wipes the phone completely. Uh, Father Andrew, what do you think of this? Is it, it the weighing the the goods here? Wh- how how do you fall on that? I I think I'm more in favor of it. I I totally understand uh, the 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 unforeseen situations, the death of a of a loved one, or uh, the those kind of situations happening, and it being quite the the hassle there. But in general, I mean, these phones are super expensive, and and so I I appreciate having just that that knowledge that. Thieves aren't going to go after my phone because I can just I can lock it up. But I think maybe what what we're getting at here in general, too, is is just people who are perhaps upgrading to a new phone or getting rid of their old phones. And just there there's a there's a push to be aware and to be like you mentioned earlier, good stewards that when you're going to get rid of an old phone, don't just, you know, don't uh, take off or don't take off the sign out of iCloud and, and right. wipe it appropriately and, and do it, set it up so that way it can be reused rather than just not doing anything and, and letting it become this this wasted piece of technology. And I think that's maybe partly what the what the the topic or the the headline is pointing at is that we just have to be more aware and right. to be good stewards of of the things that we have. And Pat, as you were saying if you're buying a phone or a watch on the secondhand market, an iPhone or an Apple Watch, uh, or an, or an iPad for that matter, uh, make sure that you're clear with people. I'm not paying for this until I'm I am certain that this is not locked, that I can get into it. Like there are escrow uh, services out there where they hold the money, a third party that holds the money uh, between you to make sure, or or do it in person, you know, if you can. Uh, but but don't don't just buy a watch, Apple Watch or iPhone or iPad sight unseen from random person uh, with because you, you're probably going to get stuck. Maybe not even intentionally. They may be unintentional, not realizing that they need to do this. So uh, that's very important. I think that Apple has a place on their website that you can go check for an activation lock based upon a, a serial number or something like that, too. Oh, it seems right. like I remember seeing something like that. Right, so maybe have them take a picture of the serial number on the device you're buying, which you got to trust that they're going to send you the right serial number, I guess. But, um, but, but yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, yes, there is a. I'll put a link in the show notes that uh, the, to the uh, web page in the support uh, section of the of uh, the Apple site that lets you check on the activation lock on your phone, iPad, iPod Touch. Um, doesn't say watch though. That's which is. Um, Interesting. So I don't know if there's yeah, something different with that. Yeah, that may be fairly new that they haven't added to the website. But I did have an actual case where I saw where a watch could not be reused. Okay, very important. That's this is that's a good a good thing to consider. Good topic uh, for for folks. And it's important again to be good stewards. Like these devices are, you know, they cost eight hundred, a thousand dollars. 
we use them for a year or two years, and then they get thrown away. I mean, even if they are recycled, they can't be completely 100% recycled. It's best if we can get a long life out of them. I mean, I, my kids are, thanks to Pat, my, my kids are using uh, iPad 2s at this point still. We're st- we get we got a full <laughs> lifetime out of these things. Uh, so uh, that's that's good. That's good. Awesome. All right, so uh, let's move on to our picks of the week. This is a little separate from our Christmas gift ideas. These are just um, some ideas, some things that we want you to consider that we have run across the past week or so and uh, or in recent weeks that we'd like to throw up for your consideration that we think might be kind of cool. So uh, let's kick it off with Father Andrew. What is your pick of the week this week? So my pick of the week can double as a Christmas gift, actually. So awesome! Uh, <laughs> I I finally recently jumped into the the bandwagon for the instant pot craze, <laughs> and uh, so you know I at, living at the rectory, I I like to do a bit of cooking when I can, and and the instant pot. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a kind of an all in one device. It's a crock pot. It's a slow cooker. It's a pressure cooker. And it's got all these settings and and you just Google Instant Pot recipes and you can find all sorts of fun recipes that make uh, what what sort of feels and tastes like a gourmet meal in a, in a short amount of time. And it's fairly easy and contained in this in this Instant Pot. And so I purchased an Instant Pot probably about a month ago now, and it's it's really fun to use mm-hmm. and I and I do really <laughs> enjoy it. The only thing that I, I regret and I didn't realize this at the time was I just went to Walmart and bought bought the instant pot there and and it was just the normal version so the one that i'm recommending for the for the pick of the week is they actually have a smart wi-fi version and Mm. that's the one that i would uh prefer and and show out to you guys because what it is is it's the instant pot but it's also got a companion app on your phone that you can then control the the cooking settings from the phone set it up Uh, you can view it as it's cooking you'll get notifications on your phone and so it's just a helpful thing if you're kind of moving about the house and you don't have to be just looking at the instant pot to to see where it's at in the in the cook process. So that is my pick of the week and another Christmas gift idea. Nice. Well, and I was really surprised that you didn't say that you were sorry you didn't get the one that was an R two D two. You know, I saw that too, and yeah, yeah, I I bought mine just weeks too early, and I had no idea. Oh, Father, I have something for you. Um, uh. There is an Etsy uh, page where you can buy uh, aftermarket wraps for your Instant Pot. Oh, perfect. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I have one of R2-D2 on my Instant Pot. <laughs> okay. so, so I will put a link in the show notes to the uh, Etsy Instant Pot uh, uh, the wraps. They're magnetic, and they, they're, 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 they're cute. They have a BB-8, and they have R2-D2, and they have some other ones, too. Uh, and they're, they're you know inexpensive. So I will, uh, I will find a link and uh, put that in the, uh, the show notes. Uh, the Instant Pot uh, Star Wars wrap. Uh, I, I, I'm sure it's called something along those lines. But uh, yeah, I like this idea. We have, an, like, like I said, we have an Instant Pot here, but it would be nice sometimes to be able to see where it is in the cooking process from another room. You know, I'm in here working, and uh, I put the Instant Pot's in the other room. Do, do I, oh, is it done? Do I, you know, because like when you're making hard-boiled eggs in it, as soon as it's done, you've got to go and, you know, do stuff to it and move the eggs so they don't overcook. You know, it would be nice to get those notifications. I like that. That's uh, um, maybe, hmm, maybe somebody will get that under the tree around here too. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it an add-on kit, or is it you have to buy a different model? You have to buy a different model. But the the other thing is, is I would want to get a bigger pot. Maybe we uh, we've been talking about getting a bigger one. We have the smaller one, like the original one of the original ones. We've had ours for a few years, um, but we find that it's a little small for a family of seven to get a full meal out of it. Um, one of the bigger ones might be uh, uh, a better fit for us, but you know, we'll see. With the, the, I'm I'm not sure how how expensive the big ones are, so that's pro- may, might be out of our price range. But um, man, those smart features really make it sound attractive. <laughs> Just as long as it's, it's uh, you check out that Internet of Things security first. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to, yeah. don't want any hackers <laughs> hacking my Instant Pot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Pat, what's your pick of the week? Well, I work with Apple products, Macs and iPads, and I work with Windows products. And I had kind of ignored the Chromebooks because I felt like, well, it's just a browser. It's not really anything I want to recommend for my clients or whatever. But based upon your having gotten one for Bella, 
Mm -hmm. And based upon having two clients that asked me to help set up printers on the Chromebooks, I said, oops, I need to learn more about them. And so I got a, a, a Dell Chromebook that's one of the ones that you can flip. And so when it becomes a tablet or you can use it as a traditional laptop. And I was really surprised how much I could do because the original ones were just the Chrome browser with maybe some Chrome apps. Now they come with Android apps. And yep. so that really expands the amount of what you can do on them. I could get Word on them. I could get Excel on them. I could use Dropbox on them. I could use my malware bytes to pr protect my browser. I found that I could, I carried it around for like two weeks. And I said, you know, I'm getting a lot of use out of this that I didn't expect that I would be able to. Yep. So there's, there's a big variance in price ranges. There's the very, very cheap, which are going to be, very, very slow. Yeah. And then there's the, the medium ones that have got a medium amount of memory and hard drive space. And I didn't know that they could have storage on their own that was really useful, that you could download stuff to it and you could put pictures in it. And you could stick SIM cards or not SIM cards, the uh, SSD cards. Um, I'm trying to think of the right term for it. But anyway, the little plug in cards that have more storage on them. And so I found it to be a lot more helpful than I expected. And I would just say, don't get the very cheapest ones unless you just want something to try out. I would say get one of the middle ones, uh, but they go all the way up to $800, $1,000 on these things. So I tend to stay away from that range. Right. Uh, but anyway, the Dell makes a nice little one, and it's very small and easy to carry around, lightweight. And as I say, for aging, my aging customers or young children, I think this might be a good alternative to having a full Windows or a full Mac laptop. Yeah, it's a great starter computer, especially for for kids or for or for folks who just don't need that much out of a computer. Uh, email, a web browser, your basic stuff like that. Uh, my, and there's games and and yep. there's th music apps and the, all sorts of things on there. Yeah, as you so, mentioned, yeah. I got I got one for my daughter and she she loves it. Uh, she she one of her favorite things is to go on Google Earth. And to explore the world with it, and uh, it's yeah, that's cool. It, and and with a Google Family Link software that I mentioned, their service, I it was a one of my picks of the week early on. Uh, that allows a parent to uh, oversee and kind of help manage and control the account. Uh, frankly, if you are if you have a, an older parent, that might also be useful for them. Not that you can that you would prevent them from using it, but to help you manage it remotely if they get into some trouble, that would be useful. Uh, All right. That's a good pick. And uh, we'll have a link to uh, an article on Tech Radar that, that lists some of the best Chromebooks uh, that are available on the market today. And it's got a full range of prices. So that was really good. All right. So my pick of the week is an app that's just been updated. Uh, it's an app for the Mac. I tried to make my, my picks a little broader that they're not just Mac stuff all the time because I, I know we have people who use Android, people who use Windows, people who use uh uh, Linux and, and and Chromebooks and all that sort of stuff. But this app is just so good <laughs> that I had to pick it because I've been waiting for so long for this update. It is Drafts for the Mac. Now, Drafts, it's it, they, their tagline is it's where text starts. And it, and it the app originated on the on the iPhone, and it was a place where you could just quickly type stuff in, and it became this sort of inbox, just a generic inbox. And what made it brilliant was its hooks into other programs. You could send that text anywhere. You could send it to uh, a text message. You could send it to an email. You could send it to, uh, you know, Evernote or your your to-do list or whatever. It became this place where text began and got moved other places. Then they added this functionality called actions, which are little, like you could program it or little automations that will do stuff with the text that you've entered. So uh, for example, you could form, like you could enter it in and say, uh, send this to everyone in my group message uh, called family. And you and you have that set up as a button, click the button, and you ty type them something in, and we'll text it to everyone in your group message. You can even get more complex. Text it to these people, but email it to these people and post it on on Facebook Messenger for these people. It's all, you know, however you want it. And there's an action directory online that they've made available where the community of Drafts users upload their own uh, Drafts actions. All right, but for the longest time, that was only available on iOS. Well, finally, it is now available on the Mac, all the actions. And what's nice is is the is almost all the actions, except for some uh, some operating system limitations, which they which are 
specific, very specific. But almost all the ones that work on iOS will now port over automatically to your Mac installation. They'll sync. So here's how I use it. This is a, I, I, this is admittedly a bit geeky, but I'm you know this is a tech podcast, so I'm going to get geeky on you. <laughs> what I do is uh, when I have I have to manage a whole bunch of podcasts on this network, and I have to have a separate project for each one of the episodes of every podcast. And that's a lot of projects, okay? Because every episode has a set number of steps. And it's usually the same steps every every week. Well, for the longest time, I was having to do that manually, which you can imagine is a lot of work. But what I did was is I set up these templates in drafts on my iPad with these uh, fill-in uh, codes, these uh, variables. And then I had some JavaScript that I would run that would... Ask me for, okay, when is the show going to post? When will the show be recorded? What is the, the show number? What is the show topic? What is the time of the recording? Whatever it is specific to that show that I needed to, to get information. And then it would put it all in, and then it would uh, put it into my OmniFocus, uh, which is my project manager, my to-do uh, software. Uh, but that had to be done on my iPad. There was just no, no two ways, because that's the only person I could do the, run these actions. And so I had a little bit of work around and it wasn't as convenient because I had to do all the typing on my iPad. It was, you know, I'm on my Mac most of the day. It, it was kind of annoying to have to turn to my iPad every time I wanted to type on the screen, every time I wanted to, you know, to set up a new project. Well, now I can do it all on the Mac, on, in drafts mm -hmm. on my Mac. Very excited. This is a, a really great piece of software. I mean, that's just one use case. There's so many use cases. Uh, I would check it out. It's free to download in the Mac App Store. Uh, they there's some of the functions are at the there's a pro like in app purchase uh, to get some of the functions some of the some of the more advanced at, um, action functions and that sort of stuff so just check it out there's a bunch of YouTube videos and the people love it's one of those pieces of software where people love it and they re make YouTube videos about it how they use it and that sort of stuff so uh, you can check it out there but I'll have a link to the uh, the the program on the uh, Mac App Store in the show notes so that's uh, my pick of the week. So we do have one little bit of feedback I want to get in quickly before we finish up here. It's uh, from Tammy LML on YouTube commenting on last week's show where we talked about impossible meat and whether we it was okay to eat that on a Friday in, in Lent. Uh, and so uh, Tammy says, for some reason, I find the impossible meat name a little cringe inducing. It makes me think Soylent Green. <laughs> As for the morality of eating it on Fridays in Lent, I couldn't agree more. No, no, no. There's a contention in my family that spends every Friday during Lent at the Red Lobster. It feels wrong to me to dive into crab legs and coconut shrimp because that's a treat for me, not a sacrifice. I've never had one of these burgers, but to me, we, aren't, we really aren't asked to sacrifice a whole lot during Lent. Save it for another day. Uh, thank you, Tammy. Uh, that's a really good perspective. Uh, frankly, uh, Catholics are not asked to give up a whole lot. Uh, if you just ask some of your Orthodox, uh, Christian brethren who have to do the great fast, <laughs> yeah. that is, uh, uh, just, uh, I won't go into it now, but Google it and find out about the Orthodox great fast. It is a big deal. Um, and in fact, Byzantine, uh, Eastern Rite Catholics also, uh, do that as well. So we're not asked to do a whole lot. <laughs> All right. So I do want to, uh, before we finish up, take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of technology, including Billy C, Placid K, Helen O, Michael S, and Eric R. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What do you think of our discussion on these various topics on two-factor authentication and on our Christmas gift ideas or anything else we talked about? Uh, you can let us know by commenting at sqpn.com slash technology or the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash Media, or you can send us an email to technology at sqpn.com. Uh, and until next time, Pat Scott, thank you for joining me in sharing the secrets of technology. It's been fun as always. And Father Andrew Kinstetter, thank you as well. Absolutely. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Technology on StarQuest. Music